Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to a very special edition of Your Encounter Today. Tonight, what is the most accurate prophetic voice in the earth today, apart from the Word of God? What can each and every one of us do to make a difference in the current political situation in this nation? I have a guest with us tonight. He's an author. He's an apologist, an historian, a missionary. But before I introduce him, I want you to introduce yourself. Right there in the comments, tell us where you're watching from. And if you're believing for anything, put those prayer request in the comments. Our team here at Encounter Ministries and everyone a part of the Encounter Today family wants to stand in faith with you. And if you haven't already, go to EncounterToday.com and sign up for our newsletter so we can stay in touch with you no matter what big tech is doing. Connect with us on a personal level. Well, apart from direct revelation in the Word of God, history is the greatest prophetic voice in the earth today, and I don't think anyone is listening. And that's why I want to bring guests like the gentleman we have with us tonight. He has several degrees in history. He's an award-winning author, a freelance columnist, a producer. He's debated on CNN, the Al Jazeera Network, Oxford, and Princeton Universities. I want you to welcome in the comments one of our favorite authors, Larry Alex Talton. Brother Larry, it's good to have you with us today. Good to be with you, Alan. Well, you're releasing a brand new book called Around the World in More Than 80 Days, Discovering What Makes America Great and Why We Must Fight to Save It. Before we get into that, I've been reading the book, but I didn't read the endorsements until the interview today. I was reading through the endorsements, and it's really a who's who in the Christian world as well as in the political world. But then I saw something strange. I saw Chris Matthews write an endorsement in this book. Is this the same Chris Matthews that I'm thinking about that wrote an endorsement for your book? Uh, It is. Um, It was actually Chris Matthews. uh, That's an endorsement for my previous book, The Faith of Christopher Hitchens. Uh Um, Chris Matthews, who was then the uh, the host of Hardball on MSNBC, um, out of the clear blue, I get a call from his producer saying he wanted to have me on and interview me about that book. And I was pretty sure that uh, he was going to try to trash me. Uh, and then I went on and he just, hey, for seven minutes, he just talked about uh, how much he loved the book and that it was beautifully written and that everyone should read the book. And uh, I was blown away and also very grateful. Well, the same is true for Around the World in More Than 80 Days. And I, I can't, uh, audience, listen, the link is in the description. This is my favorite book from the last year. You need to get a copy of it. You need to read it. And Appreciate it that. is, absolutely, it is a a work of art. Because when you're dealing with political books, many of them are dull, passionless, This is really an adventure. You didn't just sit in a room somewhere and type it up after watching the news. You traveled to more than 26 countries. It's kind of Alexis de Tocqueville's uh, Democracy in America inversion. He traveled to America to see what made America great. You traveled around the world to compare and see what made America great. What kind of inspired this book? Well, we uh, are constantly hearing, Alan, from the left, uh, how awful America is. And, uh, you know, at the time that I started this project, which was in 2017, uh, it's ramped up considerably um, since that time. But we are constantly hearing that uh, America is an evil country, that uh, we need to annihilate the past and topple all these statues of American heroes and rewrite the Constitution and uh, basically burn the whole country to the ground, quite literally, uh, hmm. it, it would seem, uh, from the behavior of, uh, of those on the left. And I thought, you know what? Um, <clears throat> the data says 69% of Americans have never been abroad. And wow. uh, those who have, I would wager the, the remaining 31% have probably just been on a Caribbean cruise or got drunk in Tijuana or a mission trip, <laughs> you know, to Africa or, you know, maybe they went to Paris or London, but they really haven't seen the world. And uh, people are accustomed these days to doing things uh, virtually, just like we're doing this interview. And I thought, you know, I'm going to take people around the world. I'm going to show them what the world is like and do, uh, as you say, an Alexis de Tocqueville in reverse and let people see what the world is really like. Because uh, before you burn this country to the ground, it Hmm. might be good to know what your options are. Well, what was the biggest surprise? You were well-traveled. I mean, you've traveled to more than 80 countries. You traveled to 26 for this book. What was the biggest surprise to you in the writing of this book and in your travels? 
You know, I, I think, and, and as you're, you're right, I, I've been to 56 countries. I'd already, before this trip, I'd probably been to, I don't know, 35 or 40. And um, so I already kind of knew what I was going to, um, to run into. That said, um, there, were, there were some surprises. Uh, one of them is that um, the popularity of Trump in the third world, mm. uh, the non-Islamic third world, yeah. um, I should I should say. Um, I also encountered a great deal of fear um, about where America is headed because uh, there's so many countries in the world, uh, that is to say poorer countries, third world countries, that depend on the United States for their own, uh, you know, whatever level of stability uh, and defense that they have, they they depend on the United States. And um, so for them to see uh, the United States having this kind of um, cultural war, um, identity crisis, as it were, uh, fills them with a sense of um, uh, a fear, yeah. uh, anxiety. I mean, we've seen this even just very recently from the French. You know, the French government has said that the American left is so radical that it endangers the stability of Western Europe. Uh, when the French are telling you that <laughs> your left is too radical, you are too radical. You've been bad when they tell you that. So these were things that I uh, that I encountered along the way, among many other things. Well, a lot of a lot of the books that we read today are people who have a profession or a a gifting in another area, and then they write a book. But you are a writer, and so you really shine whenever you put pen to paper, and you really do feel like you're. I really felt like I was with you as I'm reading the book, especially in China when you when you took us to China, mm. and I've spent some time working with the underground church in China. I've I've traveled over there, and it is it is really interesting the high tech persecution there. Many missionaries, short term missionaries go there and they work there there are phases of what is acceptable with the chinese government and so there are large ministries of of expats and and people who worship and they worship freely so long as they basically have an a, an agreement with the government but then there are other layers of the church that refuse to yield to the communist regime and regime and um read from their talking points what was your experience when you went to china and working with the church there <clears throat> Well, it's uh, it's very interesting. You should mention that, uh, um, Alan. I was in China in 2010 with a business delegation. Uh, I was in Beijing and uh, in Shanghai, and I immediately dawned on me: um, this country is not communist. Um, this country is fascist. Hmm. Um, the the only people who believe in Marxist economics um, reside in places like London, Paris, uh, Portland, Oregon, and D.C. I mean uh, the the uh, formerly communist governments of Asia know that system doesn't work. And so what they have done is they are endeavoring to, uh, to combine a, uh, a hyper-capitalism with a, uh, um, a totalitarian regime. And they seem to be doing it quite successfully. And so China, it, it struck me, you know, this isn't economically speaking, there's nothing communist about what we're seeing here. It's, it's, it's quite fascist. Mm. Um, secondly, um, I uh, attended a lecture, as I mentioned in the book, at, uh, at Peking University, Beijing, if you will, um, university. And, uh, and there, uh, here I am sitting and listening to a lecturer. Uh, and it, by the way, in 2010, a decade ago, China felt like it was trending towards freedom, yeah. uh, not, not where it is now. And uh, here's this lecturer um, talking about the quote unquote mistakes of Mao. And, uh, and I thought, uh, you know, this, is, this bothers me that he refers to, uh, you know, Mao's uh, reign as, uh, as having just mistakes. And, you know, I speak up and I say, uh, hold on just a second. Mao killed 70, 40 to 70 million of his own people. And it just sent a ripple throughout the room. Uh, people were terrified. You know, the lecturer stops and looks at both doors, and then he continues as though I said nothing. Um, I was banned from entering China on this next trip. I was followed when I was in China previously. Then when I tried to come on, uh, on this occasion, um, they said that I can only come in if I signed a document stating I would write nothing negative. And I thought, wow. well, <laughs> 
fat chance of that. Um, I, uh, I intend to trash China. And so I actually didn't get in on this particular trip, but it didn't matter because I'd already been there. Yeah. And, uh, and I've been in Hong Kong, uh, I don't know, maybe five to seven times. I've been there uh, quite a few times. And if there was anything that I would change in the book, it would be to update my comments. You know, since the book has been published, gone into print, the Chinese have crushed uh, Hong Kong. And uh, Hong Kong was uh, uh, truly a... Uh, uh, an extraordinary place. Um, the the uh, um, revolution being re led there, uh, a revolution for democracy, uh, was being led by Christians. It was being led by pastors. It was being led by their congregations. And uh, the Chinese have since crushed it, and the United States has turned the other way and simply pretended that it that it hasn't happened. But well, the United States, ESPN, Disney, not only do they turn the other way and pretend it doesn't happen. LeBron. They, LeBron. Yes. <laughs> they promote it. They do what they can to partner with them. So it's, it's, it's really amazing. The social justice warriors we have today have little to no regard for the fascist regime that's advancing around the world. What is it about Christianity that makes governments uh, so nervous? Uh, I'll quote Francis Schaeffer, the late Francis Schaeffer, who said this, that no totalitarian or authoritarian regime can talk people who say that they have an absolute universal standard by which all men and governments are judged. Hmm. You see, Christians are by nature rebels. That is to say, um, not, not that we're seeking to overturn governments per se, but a, uh, a totalitarian regime understands that a Christian's allegiance is to a higher power. Now, in under traditional American governments, uh, governance, this has been seen as an asset. Uh, I mean, Constantine recognized, the Roman Emperor Constantine recognized that uh, people who are hardworking, who are honest in trade, and who are obedient um, to government, that that's a religion that should be cultivated, not suppressed, that, that such a people are the potential backbone of a great uh, a society of a great nation. But totalitarian regimes um, view it very, very differently. It's why the Chinese are seeking to crush Christianity. It's why the so old Soviet Union sought to crush Christianity. Uh, it's why the Roman Empire pre-Constantine, uh, pre-Edict of Milan in 1313, uh, um, uh, saw uh, Christianity as a threat and it's because they won't bow down and worship the state as a god. Well, if there's one thing we've learned from history, it's that we don't learn from history. What are we seeing being repeated right now? You are, George you're, you're, Diana. You're, you're a specialist uh, when it comes to European history in particular. And I feel like, I believe it's Western European history. Is it Western or Eastern European history that you well, particularly study? Well, a little of both. Uh, I, I studied extensively Russian history. and Okay. Uh, and Marxism, but but uh, but yes, um, I, uh, I I certainly take the lessons of history very seriously. What are we seeing repeated right now? Because the church is completely and wholly unaware of European history and what has taken place, and it seems like it's just it's happening again here in the United States. The so 20th century, if I can put it this way, was really defined by our struggle against Marxism and communism. We almost destroyed the planet over it, and it seems like we've completely forgotten that as we begin to accept these ideas once again in America. So what, are, what happened in Europe that we're seeing now kind of budding in the United States that the church needs to be aware of? Well, um, Marxism is remarkably as a remarkably in, uh, durable um, idea. It it repackages itself to each generation, like atheism. By the way, you know uh, the 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 atheists who came along a decade ago were referred to as the quote unquote new atheists. Well, mm -hmm. there's actually nothing new about atheism. It's as it's as old as mankind, and uh, and we're seeing a kind of new Marxism, if you will. This is. Uh, it's been repackaged instead of um, exclusively as class warfare, it's now race warfare, which actually looks a lot more like fascism. You know, fascism, strictly speaking, is war of the blood rather than war of, of, of classes, hmm. a war of races. So we're, uh, we're seeing that now being repackaged and sold to a new generation. And what I think has gone wrong, I say this as a former educator, is, uh, you know, uh, 25 years ago, I suppose, when I when I entered that profession, 
um, I was screaming to my my Christian friends and um, colleagues and uh, any opportunity I had to speak to churches and uh, uh, Christian groups that you need to be paying attention to what's happening to your children. Um, that public schools and, and by the way, Alan, this this and I don't think I'll upset you with this, but we'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I find that there are few things that will upset people on my own side, my own team, quite so much as if you criticize their church, their football team, their country club, or their school, the place they mm. send their children. Yeah. And I don't care if it's a godless public a, a institution. My wife and I, we chose to homeschool our kids um, back in the early 90s. Now, in those days, it was like we were Branch Davidians. You know, it was like <laughs> we were, you know, we were looked upon as some kind of weirdos, you know, doing this. Now, that was our son, Michael. He went to Yale Law. I think it turned out, you know, pretty well for Michael. Uh, all of our children, um, you know, um, succeeded uh, very well, um, educationally speaking, when we chose to do that. Well, we chose to do it because when I got under the hood, of what was happening in our public institutions and in many of our private ones, I was horrified by how children were being radicalized. And uh, to this day, I often find myself sitting down with fine Christian parents, men and women who are asking me um, why their child has views that are so utterly opposed to their own. And I have to deliver to them the very sad news, your 15 minutes a day with your child cannot compete with the eight, nine, or 10 that they spend away from you. And you are paying through your tax dollars or through the tuition that you're paying to have your child radicalized, to become a hostile to the views that you hold. And I mention this because that's where we find ourselves now. It is because we weren't paying attention to what was happening with our children. Uh, the people who are filling the ranks of Antifa, of Black Lives Matter, and now even Congress with idiots like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, these are people who have no historical knowledge whatsoever. They don't know what Marxism is. They don't know the history of socialism. They seem to be wholly unaware of what the worldview is and of what Christianity brings to the table. And, and unfortunately, and I'm going to throw this in, you also have guys like Tim Keller hmm. who are shockingly, shockingly, and I say this as someone who has had a great deal of appreciation for Tim Keller's ministry over the course of his career. But he has taken a left turn, a radical left turn, where it seems to me that he is endorsing a, a kind of soft socialism, or at the very least, he isn't condemning it. And, uh, and that's leading another generation of young pastors straight off a cliff. Well, we're going to be digging into that in the podcast. Those of you watching, if, if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe to the Encounter Underground podcast, wherever podcasts are, because we're going to go deep into woke preachers and some more controversial subjects uh, after this interview on the podcast particularly. But this lack of education has robbed our children and a generation of an understanding of the exceptionalism of the United States of America. And that's yes. really the thrust of your book is to help reintroduce Americans to why we're so exceptional. Why is the word exceptional so controversial? And then on the flip side, why is it so important for us to recognize? Well, uh, I'm sure many in your audience are familiar with the very clever Pixar film, The Incredibles. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, uh, fortunately, that film was made before Disney bought Pixar. Um, but that's a very politically incorrect um, little film. It's quite subversive, um, according to the to the uh, uh, current cultural narrative. You're not allowed to be in, uh, incredible. You're not allowed to be exceptional. Um, if, you know, there's an old Russian proverb that says this, the tallest blade of grass is the first to be cut by the scythe. Um, the, the, you know, the moral of, of, of that proverb is don't stand out from the collective. You're not allowed to stand out from the collective. Now, in America, traditionally speaking, 
we have um, celebrated our exceptional people. Uh, Neil Armstrong walking on the moon or, uh, you know, uh, uh, Jackie Robinson or um, Hank Aaron or uh, Michael Jordan or, uh, you know, uh, our great scientists, our great educators, uh, our exceptional pe statesmen, these kinds of things. Um, America has traditionally been, been a country where if you invent something and suddenly uh, you're able to, um, to buy a nice home and, a, you know, people are, are patting you on the back and saying, good for you, Alan. Uh, yeah. We're now moving in, in, a, in, in another direction where we are encouraging a, a lack of exceptionalism and we are encouraging um, a, a culture of envy, a culture of tearing one another down, of bringing down those people um, who are exceptional unless they have been endorsed by the political elite, say an individual like uh, LeBron James, who is a you know, is, is certainly a, a figure who is being, he's a victim. He's, he's become a victim. Um, and, um, he's a, he's a, he is, he is endorsed by the, the elites. He's exceptional. He's a remarkable athlete. Uh, but he's a guy that is, uh, is carrying the water, um, for the left. And therefore he's kind of allowed to be exceptional, um, as it were. So, uh, American exceptionalism, the United States has kind of been this outlier sort of stood apart from what has been happening in the, the, the global narrative, which is a trend either towards Islamization or towards socialism, one of the other. And America has been able to close the border to both quite successfully. And, uh, and we have, have been uh, exceptional in almost every regard to the global narrative. Well, the left is not satisfied with that. They are determined to destroy the United States um, from within and soften it up for that socialist agenda. So in a minute, I'm going to ask you, what can we do? Because people are so frustrated right now. All they can do is kind of sure. revel in the, the pain of the past. But before we get to that... Um, as you travel around the country, you go to all these nations like Singapore, uh, Japan, <laughs> Korea. I even laughed out loud with a partially racist discussion you had with a, a young lady um, about women. That was funny. I'm not going to get into that now, but you got to read the her, book. Her comments. By yeah, the way, no, not, not yours. Mine. Yeah, not yours. Her <laughs> comments. But I just laughed out loud because I've had, as I traveled over in Asia, I've had similar <laughs> conversations. And um, so it's it's a really fun book. But the top contenders have got to be when you're comparing nations to the United States. It's got to be in Europe. So isn't Europe just as exceptional as the United States? Well. Um, uh, Europe, this is an interesting question. Um, Europe has is so far gone down the socialist road, and uh, and they have simply opened their borders wide. Uh, most European countries, you know, uh, Hungary has endeavored to maintain some level of border integrity, um, but most of Europe has been overrun and Islamicized. So I would say no, that Europe is is not exceptional anymore. I, uh, I almost look south of the border anymore. People have asked me, so if you travel around the world, where would you live? If you couldn't live in the United States, I yeah. would not live in Europe. I, mm. would, I would choose to live probably somewhere in South America. Really? Um, and that's because, uh, not because I wouldn't encounter extraordinary levels of corruption, uh, I would. Uh, but in Europe, they just simply have legalized the corruption, um, the theft, the, uh, the confiscation of your, uh, your private wealth. And, uh, and there is an authentic Christianity that continues to thrive in, uh, in, in South America and uh, that would, uh, would, would be something that would certainly appeal to me. So I wouldn't say that, I would say that Europe is, is uh, I will uh, kind of echo the refrain of uh, Mark Stein, that Europe is, uh, is, is lost. Wow. And that says a lot because you've just come from South America and we're going to be talking with you about that um, in our podcast. Um, I want to talk to you about the solutions. What's next? What can we do as believers in order to turn the tide? But I've got a special announce announcement for our audience. So we'll be right back right after this. It's time for tithes and offerings. Listen, we can't tell you what a blessing it is to have you with us here on Encounter Today and your support means the world to us. We're just a small country church reaching the world 
with the gospel of Jesus Christ and with prophetic messages like the one you're enjoying today, and we couldn't do it without your support. In fact, if it's your first time giving to Encounter Ministries, if you've never given before, we want to sow into you. We're going to send you absolutely free this series called Armed, Powerful Prayers for Perilous Times, more than six hours of teaching on how to pray in the last days. So make sure whenever you go to EncounterToday.com, you click on the giving tab, and when you give, you be looking for that email because we're going to send you those downloads absolutely free to be a blessing to you. Together, I believe that we can see a third great awakening. Go to EncounterToday.com right now. All right, we're back with Brother Alex Taunton and uh, his book, Around the World in More Than 80 Days. How can people get a hold of this book? The link is in the description. You've got your copy. I've got mine. <laughs> there we go. Uh, people can get it um, online. Uh, Simon & Schuster, Barnes & Noble. I would encourage you to buy it from anywhere but Amazon. Um, but... Um, you know, you can you can find it on uh, online retail tailors, uh, fortunately, right now, um, pretty much everywhere. Well, the book is just the beginning. And those of you watching the link to his website is in the description <laughs> of this video. You just need to connect with his blog and read these. He's got a series of articles coming out that we're going to be talking about in our podcast that are just out of this world. You need to be reading his stuff. Follow him on Twitter. We'll place all of that in the description. So we're in this situation, very tenuous in the United States. We're where there's this thin veneer of civil, <laughs> civilization that is just kind of being worn away as we see socialism, Marxism, communism, fascism creep into our culture. What's the solution? What can we do as believers to make a difference? Um, well, um, I don't mean to be trite when I say this, but I, I, and I start with myself when I say it, um, we need to pray more. Um, we need to really dedicate ourselves for to um, to prayer for this country. I was talking to a friend of mine yesterday who was talking about a, a, a pastor friend of his in Africa, an African um, who spent uh, almost every evening before he went to bed, um, you know, in prayer. And uh, I felt quite convicted from that conversation because I was thinking, you know, um, I don't pray enough. And uh, and I think that that's one obvious place for us to start. And I emphasize that because if we truly believe that we serve a sovereign, omnipotent God, that's where our petitions need to be made. Secondly, you need to understand you're not alone. Um, we're talking about, um, I think, the majority of Americans in this country. What we're seeing is a radical minority wagging the tail, uh, excuse me, the, uh, the, 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 the tail wagging the dog. Um, at moment, they are well funded. They are they are well organized, and uh, we need to become likewise organized. We need to understand that they will do absolutely anything for political power. I'm of the view that this particular election was uh, a stolen election. Time Magazine just ran a very interesting article in which they were celebrating how the election was rigged. I mean, they're openly stating we rigged the election. We we were, uh, manipulated the outcomes here. <clears throat> so um, I think we need to understand the kind of people that we're dealing with. And, uh, you know, uh, those who are listening to us might go to my website and look for an article that I wrote um, that, that went viral um, several months ago called Understanding What's Happening in America. Yes. That will, that will help them in a very big way <clears throat> to, uh, to understand not only what's happened, but what is going to happen next so i think these are things <clears throat> that we need to do and i think we need to rob big tech of our business how do we do that how do we rob apart from not using facebook i mean what do we do how do we what alternatives can we use to communicate with one another well i think we need to be prepared for the possibility that there aren't alternatives at least at present i mean do um the benedict do christians yeah in other words do christians really need to be using facebook hmm. I, I don't use facebook um, is uh, I, my life has been fine um, without it. <clears throat> Do we really need to be using? I, I've indicated on Twitter that I, I will be leaving that platform soon. <clears throat> and it's because um, it, it's rigged. 
uh, I'm watching along with just about every other conservative voice how um, you know my Twitter following is being you know turned down like volume. It's it's yeah. increasingly getting less and less and less and less. They're doing that all across um, the board. You're not allowed to say anything that is contrary to the left's narrative, or they censor you. Um, I think we need to en masse to deny them. I never use Google ever. When uh, when I was started to sign on, you know, for instance, for the, our conversation. Um, I was worried that it was going to require me to do something through Google because I don't have a Google account. I don't use Google. I don't have anything to do with Google. I refuse to use Android. And, uh, I, you know, so these are, are things that we can do. And they may see, feel like small things. Hmm. But look at what they've done to, uh, to uh, Mike Lindell and my yeah. pillow. Yeah. It is because they have organized themselves in such a way that when they seek to cancel Mike Lindell, they can do it. And uh, we have much greater, far greater um, uh, cultural weight if we will use it. And if we say, look, we are, we are walking away from Google, we're walking away from Facebook, we're walking away from WhatsApp. I don't use WhatsApp, it's owned by Facebook. I don't want anything, Google, Facebook, I want nothing to do with it. So these are all things that, uh, that we can do. And I say that also as somebody who can do better in that regard, which means I need to educate myself a little bit about you know, who owns what platforms and what apps and this kind of stuff, because sometimes I think I'm using something that isn't owned by, quote unquote, um, you know, freedom suppressing big tech, only discover that they do own it. Well, little is much when God is in it, and we are the largest special interest group in the nation. And if we were to rise up with one voice unified, we could certainly make a difference. I wonder if you would continue this conversation with me on an uncensored platform on Encounter Underground. Are you willing to go with Absolutely. me there? Absolutely. All right, those of you yeah, watching let's online, let's go there. The link is in the description. We're going to be going to the podcast, Encounter Underground. We're going to be talking about woke preachers, censorship, and we're going to dive a little more into his most recent series that he's begun on The Blood Cries Out. And uh, I've got a lot I want to talk with him about that blood in the streets. And I think it's going to inform you, educate you, and empower you to make a difference. So go to EncounterToday.com for more information. LarryAlexTalton.com. All the links for his social media are in the description. We'll see you next time right here on your Encounter Today. With big tech censorship and politically correct preachers who are fearful of offending a woke culture, where can we go for solid, prophetic Bible truths? I'm Pastor Alan DiDio, and I'm going to be bringing you uncensored interviews from prophetic voices like Mario Murillo, Jonathan Kahn, Jeremiah Johnson, Lana Vosser, and others. We are uncensored and unashamed. Welcome to the underground. Well, my friend, you're the best interviewer, <laughs> the best. And I enjoy it every single time. And together, we're going to see a miracle in America. I desperately and definitely believe that we're living in some very dangerous times that are setting the stage for what is about to happen. But if you understand the word of faith, then you know that what God has said will come to pass exactly as he said it. And it doesn't matter who's sitting in the White House. Now is the time for revival. If we don't see it now, if we don't see it, there's no hope for America. But revival begins with each of us. You know, we can't just, we have to be praying for revival as never before. There is going to be a tidal wave of unity that is going to take place where streams are going to come together. Jesus wants you and he wants you for battle. God is looking for some people that are not going to tolerate darkness, but are going to begin to confront the powers of darkness. This is a ministry for today. I just prophesy over you and your ministry. This is a present day ministry to the body of Christ. And we just ask, Lord, even over the airwaves, Lord, let the word of the Lord run swiftly. Ready your weapons to lock and load because a Holy Ghost invasion is taking place and it's coming to a city near you. Subscribe to our podcast and go to EncounterToday.com to join the rebellion. We are not pulling any punches. We are uncensored. Welcome to Encounter Underground.